Okay, uh, Prishant, instead of waiting time, uh, let us go with the presentations. Some videos are not working. Probably by the time when they set it, we will try to use the videos. Otherwise, let's get started. Uh, is it okay here? System is fine. Will this turn it into the system? We are extremely sorry for this. This is okay. 
I will manage it. kind of model we have taken for this research and uh, then what are the flow control strategy we applied mainly passive and uh, active and then uh, some work we did on the image processing which I would like to share with you and few typical results so as you know in the CSI RNA uh, I think most of you may be aware but those who are not aware about the CSI RNA it's a government laboratory uh, run under Ministry of Science and Technology and what we are doing in the CSIR, we are having typically 20 to 22 divisions where we are taking different kind of R&D activity. And uh, some are, uh, you may be knowing that this Hansa aircraft, SARS, then we have a Dresti, Autoclave where we are having all this uh, uh, fixed uh, condition. Then we have a program on drones. And I belongs to the division where we are having wind tunnels. So basically two wind tunnels and uh, uh, you may be amazed looking their size. I think uh, you are visiting the facility, they are, I think tomorrow. So you will get the glimpse of what kind of wind tunnel we are having. These are very big size wind tunnel, I think very unique in the country. And they are there from last 50 years. So any program in India, what you are seeing, aerospace program particularly, uh, graduated from these wind tunnels. So these are the two campus we are having. We, this is the Kodi Heli campus and I am situated in Belur campus. And mainly Belur campus is known as like a wind tunnel campus. Because what are the three divisions we are having? Uh, all are having the small or big wind tunnel, some sort of. So if you are visiting Belur campus, you may get glimpse of many wind tunnels. Uh, depends on their size, flow regime and uh, typical nature of testing. And uh, this is the facility where I used to work. This is the 1.2 meter trisonic wind tunnel. Uh, this is the workhorse of the country. So any vehicle what you are seeing flying today, whether it is a PSLV, GSLV, or uh, future upcoming program like human space program, everything getting tested here for the aerodynamic characterization. So just uh, as my introduction says, I am a control and instrumentation person, which last few years landed to aerodynamics. So basically, we do all sort of control. So what you are seeing here is the wind tunnel, and uh, bottom is the typical 
schematic of the control system. And this control system, what we were using earlier, all the programs and all were written in Quick Basic, which is a sort of obsolete. And now, presently, everything is in the latest lab view and all. So me and my team, we decided and this entire control system, we brought it to the National Instrument Platform some year back. Uh, we started working on 2018 and uh, today if you get opportunity to visit, you will find this VI running in the front when they are operating the tunnel. And uh, this all hardware, everything we have changed in-house. So we are, we are hoping that we will run this control system for another 25 to 30 years without any problem. These are the some measurement techniques or I, I can say rig. I am sorry, I cannot see here clearly, so I have to come little to this side. So what you are seeing here, uh, this is the setup for the typical air intake test. This is the CTS cap trip uh, trajectory simulation. These are the, actually these were the videos. I am really sorry, these are not running. So this is the LCA aircraft mounted on the typical uh, twin roll uh, model support system where we can change uh, alpha, beta simultaneously and we can perform the force measurement. This is what you, rig you are seeing is the strap on separation rig. Uh, Dr. GKs is here. He worked most of them and a uh, few of them are brainchild of Dr. GKs. So this is the typical balance model support system which we use for the force measurement. And uh, this, this is what the Slirin setup. So I, I put one nice video. I thought I will explain you how the shock waves uh, looks when we are testing in the supersonic regime. Oh, some are working, some are not working. This surprised me. Okay, so this is the typical air intake test how we are conducting in the wind tunnel. So what you are seeing, this is the wind tunnel model and uh, we have a mass flow control unit which is sitting in the back end. So basically we are we are just trying to traverse this plug from fully open to fully closed condition so that in the wind tunnel environment we can simulate kind of engine environment okay and what you are seeing here is the pressure recovery curve so when we started plug closing you can see and suddenly it will reach to the one point which is also reflecting in the slirin when it reaches to here you will find sudden change jump in the pressure profile and your shock will come out and it will start oscillating that's a very typical uh, aerodynamic problem. So basically it will give you the budge margin. So at every angle of attack, every mark, you have to characterize this. So this data is very useful for the uh, sponsor or the people who are designing this missile or the aircraft. So it will go hands on to this, them. Right. So th this is the typical measurement what we are conducting in the winter. So some of you may be interested, which once you are visiting, you can ask we can tell you in more detail. These are some other uh, specialized tests what we are conducting in our wind tunnel. So what you are seeing here is the capsule module which uh, ISRO is going to use for human space program. And this is the typical RLV model. And uh, this setup what we are using, this is the for dynamic derivative measurement. So most of you may be aware, I, I, I don't know. Uh, you, so if we are writing the controller, this is the typical equation of motion. And if you see here, there are the factors which are uh, like a structural damping, then you have aerodynamic damping, uh, model stiffness, moment of inertia. So in this equation, most of the things are known to us. So when, what is not known is the aerodynamic damping. So most of the time when any new model comes to us, we are characterizing the model for the aerodynamic damping for the particular Mach number. So these are the models we are putting in the wind tunnel and there are the specific technique for the measuring uh, dynamic derivative. So either we are doing it with the free oscillation technique. So what we do generally, we will place the model and we put some mechanism by which we can tilt the model and once blowdown is started and uh, what we can say flow established, model will start naturally oscillating. So because of the aerodynamic tapping, it will die down like this. So if you know this curve, you can derive the logarithmic decrement and from the logarithmic decrement, you can obtain the dynamic derivative. So that's a very good technique, actually experimental technique, uh, where somebody can work. And it's a very specialized technique. You cannot find it, uh, basically you cannot do it with the simulations. So it is very useful. Similar way we are characterizing this aerodynamic damping with the help of the force oscillation rate. So this, this is a slight complex because what happens, it is not possible that every model you can characterize damping derivative 
with the help of free oscillation technique. So force oscillating technique, what uh, happens? You know the model model natural frequency. You try to oscillate the model natural model at its natural frequency during the wind down. So when air comes, its damping will change. So basically, you, you your model will start oscillating with new natural frequency because of the aerodynamic damping. So you have to track that. So basically, you are trying to bring forcibly to the resonance condition. So once you get resonance, which you are detecting based on the whatever uh, forcing function you are giving and whatever response you are getting. So when forcing function and response basically goes uh, phase difference of minus 90 degree, you will say that they are in the resonance. So what, what efforts you are taking to get that? So based on that efforts, you are characterizing the force <coughs> oscillation pitch damping derivative. So these are two different techniques which we are using. Apart from that, we are also using for the roll damping derivative. Because it is not only the pitching or the eyeing which matters. When you are doing the control, it is also matters how your model is getting rolled. So roll damping is, plays also a very essential role. And that also we need to characterize, which we put the model in the rig. I have not placed the picture here, where we force the model to rotate at the particular RPM. And we try to measure the rolling moment experience during the wind down. So with these techniques, we are able to characterize for the pitch damping derivative, we are able to characterize on the roll damping derivative. We also have this steady pressure measurement and unsteady pressure measurement. I think most of the you may be aware about the steady pressure measurement, but maybe few of you may not really gone to the unsteady aerodynamics. So when it comes to the unsteady aerodynamics, it is very important. And most of the unsteady aerodynamics is the one which you are not able to simulate with your regular uh, CFD solvers. So for unsteady, we have a different kind of setup. So what you are seeing here, probably this is the LVM model. So we, we characterize this with the mounting lot of uh, dynamic pressure sensor. Okay. And this dynamic pressure sensor, what you are seeing is here. This is the one of the sensor which is placed in this. And we are placing almost like 50 to 60 sensors on the model. So where we can characterize the what are the surface pressure fluctuation on the model. So then we have a signal conditioning which you have to kept very close to the model. I mean literally you have to keep this signal conditioning model inside the tunnel. And then we have all sort of data acquisition and data processing program. We have we are using the software called Didum where we can have this 3D model and over and above this 3D model. We can put this uh, signature of whatever pressure, unsteady pressure we got. So if you see, because unsteady pressure you are acquiring with very large sampling frequency and you have a huge data set. So it is not possible for you to just plot the data like the way you are plotting the steady pressure data. So you require a specific tool where you can see this bulk of data, GBs of the data to analyze what is happening to the model at particular Mach number or particular angle of attack. So this is very helpful. So in this direction also we are working from quite long. We have uh, several setup of unsteady pressure measurement. I think we are very unique in this country where we are the only one who can characterize these models for the experimentally we can characterize for the unsteady pressure measurement because you require a first of all bigger model because you are placing large number of coolite and uh, that kind of facility is not there in this country. We also attempted uh, having the wireless data acquisition system and uh, this work again I appreciate the efforts of Dr. G.K. Surinarayana. He, it was his idea to place everything inside the tunnel and wirelessly acquire the unsteady pressure and uh, communicate to the either some Wi-Fi device or uh, tab or anything. So we attempted and we were able to do those time uh, 16 channel wireless data acquisition system where at 16 model location we have acquired the unsteady pressure data and we have transmitted it to the computer without any wire and all. So you, you may be thinking what is the great deal in this. See great deal is uh, because you are able to put everything inside the tunnel. So basically your sy signals are not getting contaminated. Because when you are measuring the unsteady pressure data, chances is there that if you are not doing it properly, you may be only measuring the noise. And you know what will happen if you are measuring only the noise. When you take FFT, you may be getting one very big peak. You may be very happy that uh, I got the FFT peak. And at the end, when you are seeing closely, you may be finding that it is only 50 hertz. So that, that's a kind of peculiar uh, measurement involved in this. 
So it's a lot of care required, otherwise you will end up measuring only AC noise. So this is the uh, typical way how we are processing the unsteady data. So basically our, most of the time one block of data, generally we go with the block. So suppose our run duration is 4 seconds, we will try to get uh, 20 to 25 blocks of the data. Each block consists of uh, around 20,480 points, which we call uh, a particular block. And uh, this block uh, is of around 200 milliseconds. So once we get uh, suppose 16 to 20 block of data, we will just get the FFT. And this, we are not relying one block of FFT data. We again, we are trying to average it for 16 to 18 block. So that whatever unsteady you are characterizing, it should have a meaningful uh, uh, objective. So just typically one, one uh, model I put where, where I can show you what is the outcome of the unsteady pressure measurement. So this is again the same model what I put it previous slide. And if you see, this is the mark sweep. So your x-axis, we have a continuous mark variation. And on the y-axis, we have a pressure fluctuation. So at one particular mark, you may see here, there is a jump in unsteady pressure fluctuation. And based on these results, so these are the unsteady pressure which are plotted in the model surface. And based on these results, you may be also finding it that initially the GSLP configuration was having this kind of cone geometry. So based on these uh, initial test at uh, CSIR NL, we have made this initially OGI and then it gone to the canted canted kind of uh, booster. Okay. So basically the objective is for such uh, canting of the booster, it reducing heavily the unsteady pressure fluctuation near the vehicle. Okay. So your vehicle uh, structure is more safe when you are having this kind of configuration. It's only for the boosters, even for the... Yeah, so I will come. So what happened? In one phase we have modified the booster and one particular phase we have modified for the nose. Okay, so what our my uh, talk which I am concentrating is based on the nose, how we are optimizing the nose geometry based on the unsteady pressure measurement. Okay, so with this uh, initial background, what we are doing at CSIR NL, let I move to my topic of the today's presentation, uh, how this transonic uh, shock wave boundary layer affects on the geometry of the particular spacecraft. So what you are seeing here, you, these are the few vehicles which in, which face this uh, problem of unsteady pressure, large unsteady pressure fluctuation at beginning of their uh, flight uh, when they conceived uh, such a structure. So what you are seeing here is the Titan 4B. This is a very famous configuration for Buffett study. So one of the Titan 4B configuration failed during the initial uh, transonic uh, trajectory. This is the Aries configuration. I have some typical data where they encounter the large pressure jump during the uh, flight of the Aries vehicle. What you are seeing here is the Vega configuration. So Vega also you will find a lot of literature where they characterize for the unsteady pressure and based on the unsteady pressure they have changed this geometry several times. GSLV MK1 already I told you and uh, this LBM3 gone to this kind of changes where initially this booster as well as this nose was having conical in shape and uh, later we made it canted and the OGI kind of uh, geometry. So what uh, we thought, why not, these, these are the all models which are available in the literature. So why not we can go for some generic model where we try to understand what is causing the occurrence of this large unsteady pressure fluctuation. So what we have done, we have uh, made a very simple geometry where we it is uh, having cone and then accompanied by the cylinder region and then bottle and then a longer launcher vehicle. Some of you may be thinking why we required such studies. And what is the great deal of uh, changing this frequently? Why not changing the entire vehicle? So even if you go for the ISRO, they are having a very large, uh, tested, reliable launcher. Right? So they, they don't, nobody wants to disturb their launcher. They want to disturb their payload. Payload, payload fairing and the no spoon. Right? Because something is already tested. Who wants to change the engine for the sake of the aircraft structure? Nobody. Right. So here also scenario is same. Nobody wants to disturb the launcher. Instead of that, what, what they generally do, that if you want to accommodate large uh, payload, like in case of ISRO, you may have heard that uh, some time back they launched uh, 104 satellite in one go, or 40 satellite in one go. So in that case, what they generally do, 
they increase the size of the payload fairing. So when they increase the payload fairing to maintain this nose cone, it will become vehicle become very large. Right? So only only alternative is that you start changing this nose seal. And instead of 15 degree, why not we can make it 20 degree or 25 degree? Whether it is possible, it may be possible, but we have to characterize it. Like in case of Aries, if you see this nose cone angle is almost like a 32 degree. So based on the requirement of the payload, your geometry of the payload fairing and the nose cone required to change. So basically, to solve such problems, there are the two approaches. As I said, one approach is you just go with the nose geometry change, which may not be possible all the time. Okay. Another way, why not we can use some passive and active devices which can solve our uh, requirement. So we are working on the second approach where we are trying to solve this with the help of the active or passive device. And basically what we are trying to do, we are trying to energize the boundary layer. That's the whole objective. So some literature, let I just quickly go through. So this all started from the 1962 because what happened 1950 to 1960, there are a large number of uh, space launch vehicle failure and that also in the transonic ascent phase. Okay. So they, they started digging and then from there this all uh, research is started and they found that uh, this hammerhead kind of configuration which is very common in the initial NASA phase, they are finding that there is a large pressure fluctuation in the uh, transonic Mach number. Then further to this, uh, this Chevlier and Robuston in 1963, they have a very classical paper which says that any missile configuration which is having the nose cone uh, and cylinder geometry goes through basically these four kind of flow phenomena. So it is started with the separated flow, alternating flow, then you have a uh, attached flow. So this, this four mode of shock wave oscillation and the attached flow. So basically these four mode of flow uh, when vehicle accelerated in the transonic regime, every vehicle encountered this. And out of these four, interestingly, this is the one which is causing large unsteady pressure fluctuation, that is alternating flow. So what it mean by alternating flow? Basically, it is alternatively flow is in the either in this zone or in this zone, right? So basically either flow is uh, separated or it is attached. Or so if flow is oscillating between attached and separated, it is called an alternating flow. And this because of this, this is start giving an impulsive load, it is very dangerous for the vehicle structure. Okay. So further to that, uh, again Co and uh, Kasky, they did the, some work on this uh, nose geometry change. And they found once you start increasing the nose geometry, there is increase in the unsteady pressure fluctuation. This is another paper in 1964 uh, by Kistler and in fact this is the very classical work where uh, during supersonic if we have a forward facing step they found that uh, shock which is emanating from this point giving the square wave kind of pattern and this is this is the some sort of clue what is happening in present case. So because of the shock this pressure uh, fluctuation in this zone is finding a square wave kind of pattern basically this shock is oscillating in this zone. So basically, there is a communication. Downstream is communicating to upstream. And further to this Cole, Erickson and Rennie, what they gave, uh, they, they found some sort of criteria. So what they decided, if you follow these guidelines, your vehicle structure will be buffet free. So, but this is not possible always. Okay. So safer side, if you find the way where you can limit to your uh, vehicle structure, which can give you delta P by Q, between 0 to minus 0 0.14 and your uh, this slope within 0 to 0.2 then your vehicle is a buffet free and uh, you can go ahead but that is not the general case further to this uh, this rainy and all the 1965 what they they characterize buffet also in two way so they, they are telling telling this is the low frequency buffet and if you have a separated flow and there is a shock oscillation you are finding the high frequency buffet so somehow with the treatment of the structure, you are able to limit this. But again, you cannot fly the spacecraft which is having this kind of signature. Because these are the low frequency, uh, high, high pressure fluctuation on the low frequency which is very dangerous to the integrity of the structure. 
so we are trying to address this okay we are we are not focused on this so based on this uh, further uh, erickson and all what they given they given the uh, what are the zones for the alternative flow so whether we can characterize that if you have a particular uh, cone cylinder configuration so these are the zones of the alternative flow so what type of cone you take even 15 degree you take with your uh, geometry there are chances that it encountered a small zone of alternative flow so you see that 15 degree is having a small zone of alternative flow when you start increasing go 30 degree it is becoming fat and fat so that zone is increasing so basically you have to work on this and you have to suppress that this is another work uh, which is in uh, i was talking about the aries so aries if you see this this sing pressure signature is in one circumferential generator okay so basically suppose you take this generator so you 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 are seeing 0 degree 45 degree 90 degree 135 degree and 3115 degree so every 45 degree you are finding one generator and you see the signature of the pressure fluctuation okay so suddenly you are finding the square wave kind of pattern here and which is not there at this zone so it's a one circumferential where in the 3d basically your pressure signature is changing okay so how it is possible so basically it is encountering the kind of alternating flow in that zone okay or there is the uh, some vertical structure which is causing this type of the pressure variation and to address this what they because this they encounter during the flight okay so during flight they got a sudden jump in the pressure fluctuation which they were not expecting and in fact it it, it didn't happen in the most of the aries flight it happened during one of the aries flight so further they have taken a internal study and they mounted believe me they mounted 256 sensor on the single model and they characterized for the buffet so you, they because our tunnel although we are telling it is the largest uh, wind tunnel available in this country but we are able to mount only maximum 44 coulomb in the model they have mounted 256 coulomb so that they can characterize for the this unsteady pressure fluctuation properly and they can find what what is causing this okay yeah it's a model big size because they tested it in uh, nasa 11 feet by 11 feet uh, continuous wind tunnel so size of the tunnel is quite big so they were able to accommodate this okay and that kind of uh, data acquisition system processing everything required right so they accommodated and they tested this so this is another very good literature if some of you interested on this buffet area you can just go through it further to this i spoke to you that 1962 they started this co and note work okay so there they mounted some seven or eight coulomb now what what they did they again they fabricated in the nasa this model which hammer head configuration they tested on 1962 and uh, again they populated this with 216 coulomb to just check whether whatever signature they got in 1962 whether it is really right and they characterize and you see that uh, most of the results are matching with the 1962 and they confirm that yes there are chances that during the transonic uh, flight it may encounter the alternating flow which is dangerous to the vehicle structure and they further did with the psp and uh, uh, large number of uh, pressure sensor and they got uh, this kind of uh, uh, shock wave which are present in the heat shield zone okay so you may also ask the question why it is very important that you suppress the shock oscillation in the payload region these shocks are also available uh, in the uh, launcher phase or if you have the fairing okay or flare there are also this kind of phenomena may be there but it is very important to suppress this in the payload region because your satellite is satellite and the whatever accompanied electronics everything is kept here okay so su suppose your vehicle encountered this kind of large vibration chances are there that your vehicle may survive but when it goes to the particular orbit when it when time has come to uh, release the satellite it may not work because your electronics may not be uh, able to survive that kind of the vibration so that is very important because people generally will think that okay if structure is not failing everything is safe so that's not scenario so there are the few flow methods also reported which we can use for such uh, flow control and one of them is like you can uh, have a perforated uh, heat shield 
and this is study also done way back in uh, 1997 uh, by one of our uh, team member and uh, further to this there are the way by which we can have active and passive devices which are protruding outside uh, this nose this, this is the our area where we are working people also attempted to have a counter flow and counter flow is a very famous technique to control the aero heating aero heating and uh, aerodynamic drag reduction so there in the hypersonic regime lot of people are using counter flow jet people are also attempted to use dielectric barrier discharge this is very new and in fact this whatever you are seeing this we have tried in our tunnel so what what basically here we are doing if you see we are just making a sandwich structure like this where we are trying to give the 40000 volt in the wind tunnel to generate the ionic wind so whether it is possible to energize the boundary layer by this this is the one of the best way but unfortunately it is still limited and required a lot of research where we can enhance the velocity achieved through this dielectric barrier discharge right because currently whatever voltage you apply and whatever good quality electrode you uh, place you will get maximum 5 meter per second so 5 meter per second even it should affect the boundary layer but kind of our tunnel because dynamic pressure is very high it is not showing any effect and you cannot measure also in this zone by placing the coolant sensor so you are relying you are relying only on the your uh, flow visualization so flow visualization has not reflected any change because of the dielectric barrier discharge so our focus is primarily on the passive devices and the active devices by placing the counter flow jet another way of if you are having suppose uh, as i said this phenomena is also there where flare is there so if flare is there during supersonic you will find shock is oscillating in this zone okay so it is not the only which it is like a problem of uh, payload fairing it is also problem where you have a, a flare and this shock is oscillating here that can be tackled nicely by the micro vortex generator so if you place the micro vortex generator here because they are immersed in the boundary layer they will give a good control so people tried controlling this flare induced shock with the help of micro vortex generator this is a study also conducted in nl by one means neil gorson and uh, dr sasi gusan barma so this also but this is not applicable in case of if you have a shock oscillation in the payload region because there is no scope where you can mount this vortex generator near the solder so just if i want to summarize so i think most of the literature i covered and uh, only what i left is uh, some work done by me and uh, dr gk s and uh, our colleague dr giris so 2020 and 2021 we published some work on the passive flow control so you can go through it i may not cover that in detail so research gap is that uh, very few people attempted controlling such flow with the help of uh, these devices whereas you will find lot of literature on hypersonic and supersonic but transonic uh, especially on the unsteady pressure fluctuation and its control is very limited so prime motivation of doing this work is uh, as i said aries configuration our own gslb configuration which has gone through lot of changes on the strap on and uh, heat seat uh, that uh, ojai and this aries as i said uh, it is a wind tunnel prediction and in the flight you got this kind of change so that that prompted them to do this kind of uh, further study and the flow is uh, moving back from subsonic to supersonic so basically with these uh, we have done so i am happy that this video is also working so you can see here what is happening so basically this this is because this video got compressed so you are seeing this shock is somewhat chaotic in nature otherwise it is very sequentially moving with the good frequency so you see it is happening here also it is happening here also so this is the inherent property of the cone cylinder junction when you are having typical mark number where flow will experience alter kind alternate kind of flow phenomena and this if you characterize at what frequency this shock is uh, oscillating you can do some image processing you can get this kind of uh, time versus uh, x by l curve so probably you guys are uh, much smarter on the image processing and all so you can get some videos you can play around that some of uh, student i don't know monica is here no she is not here okay so i gave some work similar to this so where she characterized this shock motion not particular shock motion some other sort of vibration 
okay so basically what we are what i am trying to tell so at 3 degree it is having one dominant frequency at 4 degree it is having one dominant frequency which you cannot uh, go to have a flight with such configuration you have to address this mechanism of soft oscillation pr pretty simple as i said by kissler and all it is already demonstrated that you have a square wave cut up pattern in airfoil you will get lot of literature where this transonic buffet is a very famous problem in case of airfoil so there they say that in the trailing edge these kutta waves are generating and pushing the shock upstream whereas uh, incoming flow will push the shock downstream and this cause the this particular shock oscillate in the airfoil we are predicting that similar uh, mechanism is responsible of shock oscillation in our case of the model because this model is also accompanied with the bottle where you have a separated flow so these kutta waves also making responsible for such oscillation also so this our model we given the flow topology somewhat very similar to the what kissler and all proposed in 1964 in case of axis symmetry nobody uh, given any top flow topology but it exactly follows in the similar way when shock oscillate in this zone it is giving the square wave kind of pattern which is giving indirectly a low frequency jump which is similar case in the case of the flare because this is the cross flow so basically when your upstream up up leeward side boundary layer is thick and weak this cross flow will make it not to be distant and it will separate so in our case we have uh, used these models okay so basically if i explain you geometry we have a uh, 15 degree which is a suitable one what we are claiming then we made another nose 20 degree 25 degree nose and we given the provision where we can use this particular adapter for the jet as well as for mounting the passive devices so it's like modular structure where we can change the nose we can change the passive device we can use the jet with different momentum ratio and blowing coefficient and we can test in the wind tunnel so these are the two set layer uh, what are the jet condition we use uh, these are the all uh, under expanded jet with different uh, pressure ratio and uh, this is the mod photograph of the model these nozzles are sitting in this adapter so we have made a different set of the model where we can change the mass flow with the help of these uh, different dia nozzle experimental setup as you may be aware we have tested this model in the two foot uh, wind tunnel which you are visiting tomorrow and these are the coolite pressure sensor so basically this model we have given the panels where we can mount the coolite and uh, we can change whatever required these are the worldwide tunnel uh, pressure fluctuation because you should characterize unsteady pressure in the tunnel where tunnel noise is less so basically your tunnel should be quiet otherwise you cannot characterize for the unsteady pressure measurement there okay so if you see our two foot so we, we are lying somewhere here so I, I i think when you see worldwide all the tunnels we are our tunnel is much quieter so it is uh, best suitable for the unsteady pressure measurement and we use the high speed camera so where we can because it's a you you cannot rely only on the pressure measurement because pressure measurement you can do at the particular location you cannot populate so many pressure sensor in such a small model so we are relying more on the flow visualization so where you can uh, acquire image at the 10,000 frame per second and later you can do the DMD you can do the POD based on the cytograph images so let, let I show you some typical result so these are the results of the force measurement most of you may be aware about the force measurement how we are doing the force measurement in the wind tunnel so basically your model is mounted on the six component strain gauge balance okay so basically this is the floating frame balance which is uh, inside this model and when model will go with certain angle of attack so basically how we do in the wind tunnel when flow establishes we provide the angle of attack to model at some rate and we try to measure all these six component data in our data acquisition system so you see the typical uh, plot cn versus angle of attack cpm cat and xcp so there when we go to 25 degree you will find a sudden jump in the pitching moment and this 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 is the one which required to be addressed and that only we are trying to control with the passive devices this is the typical pressure time history so you see when you are using 15 degree nose cone you have a very random kind of signature of the pressure fluctuation 
the minute you move to the 20 degree and 25 degree what is happening at the k1 k2 basically just let i tell you k1 is mounted here k8 is mounted here so basically in the payload region we are having only eight coolite okay and th these coolites are started giving you this kind of signature so basically when you have a square wave kind of pattern that is indirectly tells you that you are having the low frequency so further i just zoomed one uh, block set of the data what you are seeing in the black it is a moving average of the uh, signal so you see that you are having large jump in the pressure okay and these these are the accompanied shadow graph you see here looks flow is looks like a separated whereas flow looks like here like it is a <coughs> having a shock wave so if i see this plot <coughs> basically what i am showing here this is the 3d plot having a signature of 15 degree 20 degree and 25 degree so 15 degree is in with well within acceptable band whereas your 20 degree and 25 degree you see 20 degree and counter alternating flow here where large jump in the low pressure you are finding here and 25 degree you are having here so th th this is the basically problem in the basic configuration and corresponding cp as well as cp rms so you see that 15 degree is here and when we go for the 20 degree and 25 degree you have you are finding the large jump in the pressure fluctuation cp gradient also getting change these are the cytograph images of the 15 degree 20 degree and 25 degree you see 15 degree is more or less shock pattern is stable whereas 20 degree and 25 degree you are having the change in the shock pattern so when we are using these passive devices i have just put the optimized one I have just put the optimized one. <coughs> so when you see the these passive devices, so your 25 degree is having jump. Okay, this is the black one is the basic, which is suppressed by the <coughs> sorry, <coughs> aerial spike and aero disc. This is also confirmed in the uh, Mark Swift. <coughs> so in the Mark Swift, basically. When you, you change the angle of attack and cont continuously vary the Mach number, you are finding the jump at some, uh, <coughs> sorry, at some uh, critical angle. When you use the spike and uh, aero disc, you are finding that more or less linear uh, coefficient, aerodynamic coefficient. And these things we characterize with the uh, FFT. So what is happening, your low frequency jumps, which were there in the basic configuration, getting suppressed by the passive device. But of course, when low frequency you are suppressed, you energy will be adjusted somewhere else. So you are finding uh, some dominant peak at the higher frequency. But that uh, is not concerned to us. And these are the some cytograph images, just to get the glimpse, what is happening with uh, the presence of these passive devices. So here you are finding the oscillating shock wave <coughs> in the heat shield region, which is uh, well stabilized in case of the active, uh, passive device, optimized passive device. These are the, some parametric study. So if you see, if you are uh, changing the dia, what we, we, we did in our case, we have used the different spike. So where we are changing the stem length, also we are changing the diameter of the disc. So, when we are changing the diameter of the disc, so right now I have taken these three cases. So you see, this is the basic signature of the pressure fluctuation. And very, very gradually, it is started reducing. So this is, this is the first case, this is the second case, and this is the third case. So in the presence of this forward facing uh, aero disc, there is a large suppression in the pressure fluctuation, which is also evident in the, your FFT. FFT, I have put the only optimized one, the second case. You may ask why not the third case, because once you start increasing this disc size, you are also adding the unsteadiness in the nose region. So somewhere you have to optimize. You have to take the case which is not loading much on the nose and also trying to suppress in the heat seal zone. I have bulk of the data I have clubbed together and plotted here. So it is not that it is shown in one block of the data. It is also shown throughout the data. 
So we have clubbed uh, almost eight block of data. That's why you are seeing 1.6 second data. So everywhere you are signing a smooth curve when we attach a spike and arrow disk. And this is the cumulative. So argument is that okay, you may be adding, you may be reducing in some frequency, but whether you are also adding large amount of pressure fluctuation in the higher frequency. So just I want to highlight that that is not the case. If you see till 40 kilohertz, everywhere these passive devices are able to control the pressure fluctuation. So which is basic is here and you see in case of aero spike and aero disc, even if you are adding cumulative, you are starting with the low frequency, every frequency delta f which is around 5 hertz, if you are keep adding cumulative, you then also you are way below to the basic configuration which is plotted here on the 25 degree. Okay. We also conducted the surface ion flow visualization which is very common in most of the engineering college so you guys should really see this how we are getting the pattern. Okay. So this uh, generally this is the oil mixture prepared using 1 is to 2 into 3 ratio of oleic acid, hydraulic oil and titanium dioxide and this is the kind of oil pattern we just spray on the model and conduct the very short duration run <coughs> to assess basically what is happening in the model surface. And you see this is the for the first time we able to capture experimentally that there are two counter rotating vertices on the payload region. Okay. And basically that is the one which is creating, which is opposing the mean flow and causing this kind of problem. So this is very unique and it is reported in our one of the paper. So you can go through in detail. This is another surface oil flow visualization Sir. where we it is shown with the control device how it is behaving. Sir, I had a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, sir, why weren't you able to visualize the vertices in the shadow graph of the slur and, and only on the oil flow? Ah, see, these are the footprints actually. So basically, when when you are trying to visualize the oil flow pattern, you can only see the how the flow, where flow separates, where re attach, and what is the kind of footprint on the surface. Okay, so when you visualize, you cannot get the gradient in such a way that you can visualize whole vertex in the shadow graph. That's the way I understood. Maybe Dr. GKS can uh, further explain you. Yeah, Schlieren is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional phenomenon. Uh, what happens on the surface, Schlieren cannot find out. You have to use the uh, surface word. So CFD data also never suggested that there might be a word. There have been some studies. CFD studies also have been shown. Actually, if you see some paper CFD, they are able to get some uh, vertical structure, but not on the payload. They are Further down, if you see in case of Titan 4B, uh, there are some paper where they are able to get the vertex footprint in the CFD, but not exactly on the payload region. So with the, this uh, arrow spike, you are uh, we are able to control this kind of uh, vertical structure in such configuration. Okay. So I also put some work we did with the image processing, which is very common and very interesting for the engineering graduates. So thing is, because you guys are much familiar with the MATLAB and uh, able to write the codes and all. So what we started doing, this is a very unique way we started working on this. So we have just taken this uh, uh, algorithm where uh, in the MATLAB it is very famous algorithm, uh, paper salt. Okay, so it's like just some salt particle which we are treating like a noise and can be characterized what, what is the amount of salt you have is sprinkled on the photograph okay so with that so suppose this is the reference image and you have taken another image where you just spread some salt and can you characterize because of this salt what is the kind of noise you added in the image so if you able to characterize for the normal image i will take this as a basic algorithm and characterize my cytograph image or the motion of the salt because in case of shock also what is happening? Shock is oscillating at some particular frequency. So if you take the proper frequency when you are capturing the video, if you take the proper frame rate, you should able to extract the shock frequency from this kind of algorithms. So this is the sum of uh, our work which uh, uh, Dr. GKS did uh, initially in the NAL and later we use this uh, this kind of algorithm what I explained here and we try to get the this sock what is uh, moving here so basically this is the ramjet 
kind of configuration and when it uh, encounter the budge phenomena this particular shock will violently oscillate at the low frequency and if you mount the coolite you will get this particular uh, frequency but again coolite will tell you what is happening locally to the sensor so if you take this complete cytograph which is captured at the very particular frame rate so like in this case we have taken 2000 frame per second and we are talking about the frequency of 102 hertz which is very low so we able to characterize so this plot what you are seeing we are just characterize this phenomena with the help of that kind of algorithm further if you are tracking the shock there also we are using the algorithm uh, basically the MATLAB algorithm which is very common so you can track the intensity and you can find out how the shock is oscillating you also can use the same algorithm if you cut down a small slice you take a small slice and you start moving that slice when it comes to the shock there will be huge error when you are comparing with the reference image and in this way you can track the shock how it is moving so here what I did uh, basically this is the model you have a mark profile and with varying mark number how the shock is moving from front to the back you can track using the this kind of algorithm of course they will give initially some uh, error you can fine tune them and you can nicely capture what is the shock motion how it is moving if it is oscillating at what frequency it is oscillating that and all will be very helpful so let i move to the further active flow control so in active flow control as i said we have used the uh, sonic jet which is just forward facing sonic jet okay only sonic condition we have used and we have used different kind of momentum ratio okay so we have taken the basic configuration because as what what is the concept here if your passive device works your active device also should work because your passive device basically disturbing the mean flow generating some eddies which are going and energizing the boundary layer so same concept should work for the active device if it is the truth and to our surprise that is also working in the similar way so if you see when you start increasing the pressure ratio or momentum coefficient you will see that uh, this unsteady what is there is very huge in case of basic configuration suddenly getting suppressed and you have a minimum level so this is somewhat a very similar way the way aero disc is working you are finding that this also working in there and we have a detailed uh, characterization with the sonic jet and we are finding large reduction in the low frequency content on the 25 degree nose cone so this is another 3d plot where we have an entire picture of uh, active flow control device how it is working so if you see this this is the red one is the basic then we started increasing the momentum coefficient of the jet and then you are finding that uh, at the extreme condition what we check you have a very minimum uh, unsteadiness in the heat shield zone and these are the uh, without wind picture these are the with wind you can see that your shock is uh, more or less very weak and stable here in this case okay so if you see the this video here how violently this shock is oscillating in the heat shield zone so argument was that okay in the wind tunnel you are actuating the your sonic jet and then you are starting the wind tunnel so you are disturbing the mean flow and that's why it is controlling so what we did okay let model will go from minus 4 degree minus 4 minus 2 0 2 4 and when it reached to the 4 degree we allowed for some time to capture the video without jet and then after some time we actuated the jet to see the effect how it is stabilizing this particular saw which is oscillating in the this zone so this complete video is there just to have a crux i can show you the pressure signature you see the red one is the without jet and the black one is with jet so it is clearly showing with the pressure sensor data that when you have actuated jet you have a just random kind of pressure fluctuation not whatever the unsteady square wave pattern was there it's totally got suppressed I think it is you are you may be seeing here so jet is coming here you that's what you are you are seeing some socks here and this particular sock which was oscillating in this zone it is completely getting stabilized 
So with this let I conclude that we have uh, tested all these 15 degree, 20 degree and 25 degree nose cone configuration in our CSIR NAL bed tunnel. And we found that uh, whatever soft oscillation is happening in the heat shield zone which is prime cause of the transonic buffet phenomenon is getting suppressed with the help of the active and passive flow devices. And we had a detailed uh, characterization with the active and passive flow control devices and a uh, few of the result already published, few are we are in the same process to make the paper and uh, publish it. I would like to acknowledge Director NL for this support and of course Dr. G. K. It's uh, everything is brainchild of his, I am just uh, his student so. <laughs> All technical staff and all and we are also taking help of uh, IAC because this work we are doing in collaboration with the Indian Institute of Science. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, uh, this is this probably in the range of uh, 8 to 10 kilometers. 8 to 10 kilometers. And then recently some failure happened in Japanese yes, uh, spacecraft. No, it's that's what, the, if you see like in our uh, Indian perspective, our previous uh, SSLB got failed. So, you may have read in the newspaper, they are quoting that uh, it encountered the large vibration. But it didn't fail on the transonic flight. Right? So, finally what happened, some sensor didn't work, some actuator didn't work. So, you cannot directly link it to the transonic failure. But most of the failures are encountered through large vibration where accompanied electronics is getting failed or some actuators are getting failed or few flights got failed in the transfer. So that. Thank you. Uh, okay, these are the very special uh, dynamic pressure sensor. Uh, Q-Light, uh, we are buying it from the Q-Light. So basically these sensors are flush mounted on the surface. So that's the reason they are very small in size. Because most of these models are cylindrical in nature. So if you mounting a bigger sensor, it will disturb your flow. So these, whatever sensor we are mounting, they are only 1.6 mm dia. Okay. And I, I just for uh, your knowledge sake, I will tell you, one sensor cost us around 1.6 lakh. So if you are mounting your 50 sensors, it's a very costly experiment. A uh, few cases like if you are uh, the guy who is mounting the sensor is skilled, you may use it for one or two company. Otherwise, it's like one company. No. We are not. Mostly those who are in hypersonic flow regime and all, they are more concerned about the temperature. These sensors comes with the temperature compensation modules. So, they are not going to give output based on the temperature. So in the typical activation for the active control, how, how long do you need the jet to be active during for control? So it's like uh, we have activated for the throughout the run duration. Yeah. So because our typical run duration for this model was almost like a 35 second. So it was activated for a complete 35 second. But as I said, we also checked when this process is starts, suppose this uh, shock oscillation starts, if that minute we are switching on the jet, whether it is controlling. So that last slide was on that. Because in the flight vehicle eventually, yeah, the cage, the yes. jet generation. Right, right. right. Yes. Yes, yes. No, because again, again such uh, jets, they are not new. You will find a lot of literature where these jets, counterflow jets are used in hypersonic flight. So argument is, it's not going to use just for your transonic regime. If you have a provision, they further can be used for the reduction of air heating and other It's like film cooling, no? Yeah. It acts like film cooling. If you, if you are throwing this jet on the nose, it's like film cooling, which you require for hypersonic regime. In between PSP and oil flow visualization, which one is the best method to visualize the surface flow? PSP is entirely different technique. 
So it's a like a well proven technique where you can map your pressure data on the surface. Whereas basically your surface flow visualization will give you just kind of where separation is occurring, where reattachment is occurring. If overall vertical structure is there, what's their footprint? It's that. How will we decide that? Go ahead. How will we decide like how many pressure sensors should be uh, like mounted on the uh, model and where it should be mounted? Yes. So again, see like in this model we are working on the research mode, right? Now suppose you go for the real flight mode. Now their flight mode you cannot take a chance, right? So you you should have a signature throughout different generators and then uh, stream wise different places everywhere. So like now we are testing it for the Gaganya. So there every time we mount uh, 45 collides because our models are smaller in size. So you cannot afford to put all uh, 150 collides in one go. In, in actually speaking, you have to put that because it's a, everything is simultaneous. You cannot say that this buffet, uh, whatever phenomena you are observing, uh, it will repeat in the second turn off. Because Aries, I said, they had a six, seven flights. They have not encountered any problem. But one of the flights, they encountered this problem. So it's an unsteady in nature. It, it cannot be guaranteed that your next attempt, you will encounter this problem. Because it's a function of Mach number, angle of attack, gust, other uh, disturbances in the mean flow. Lot, lot more. So difficult to predict. Uh, Let me answer your question. Oh, yeah, please go. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, no, sir. Uh, sir, were any of the changes that were made within the testing adapted into the real launch vehicle? Means the testing that were done in NAM. Mm -hmm. That's a. <laughs> I mean, uh, see, these are the research point of view. Okay. When really you want to accommodate this technology to the mission mode spacecraft, lot more required to do. It's not just you characterize the transonic flight and you can accommodate these devices to the directly on GSLB. No, you have to, further you have to do lot more. Uh, so also another follow up, uh, for example, if there is a issue that you got to know is caused by icing, how do you simulate, uh, sorry, how do you uh, test it in a wind tunnel because you cannot maintain those temperatures within the world. Okay, so yeah, this uh, question is slightly away from my domain. So icing and all, there are the specific tunnels where they do simulate this icing. And uh, it happens to that I visited some uh, icing tunnel in New York. So basically there they create this kind of environment and they, they test. But not in our tunnel. Uh, sir. So how different is, like within transonic regions, how different is working on the nose when compared to the nozzles? Like I'm sure uh, there are things that happen to the nozzle as well since it's happening in, on the nose. I didn't get it. So within the transonic regions, there are a lot of things that happen, uh, as we already know, on the nose cone, like the separate research for that. Uh, is it similar for nozzles as well? Okay. Yes, yeah. For, it may be, but frankly speaking, I am not aware. Is any sort of research going on uh, in NAL for nozzles uh, as similar to nose cones? If you may have heard Dr. Venkat Krishnan sometime back, uh, so they do some research on uh, nozzles. Yeah, so they test some nozzles in the base flow facility. I do not know whether you are visiting that. Right now they are testing some plug nozzle on the base flow facility. First, let me answer your question. Uh, nozzle is usually in the back of the vehicle. It's at the rear end. So it's exposed to more of internal flow dynamics rather than external flow dynamics. But if the nozzle projects out of the wake of the body, then you have flow-induced vibration. Like Most what happens in GSLV MK2, nozzle. nozzles have canting as well as gimballing. Because you know, the stack-on nozzle can be used for pitch and your control. So you have gimballed nozzles. So when you gimbal the nozzle to a large extent, it has interaction with the outer flow. And that can create the fluid structure interaction. That can create instabilities. So that has been studied. It was a problem in GSLV MK2, the problem was solved. Now coming to um, what uh, uh, Siddhi asked, uh, PSP is uh, the limit, there are some limitations in PSP. First of all, the flow field should be visible to the camera. Okay, And what you see is a 2D projection of a 3D dimensional phenomenon. So if the phenomena is happening on top and you cannot visualize the top of the model, 
to lose that information. And PSP, you need to record. So it has to be online. Uh, and moreover, uh, PSP, it does not respond to high frequency oscillations. Uh, so far, when people are trying to make it dynamic, but so far, not, they have not been successful very much. So if the pressure is changing with time, PSP cannot change so that fast. Because the color crystals have their own time to respond. So it remains steady, even though pressure is uh, unsteady. These are the limitations. A round of applause for sir and his explanation today. Thank you so much for the insightful talk, sir. I would now uh, request our chairman to felicitate our guest.